In this chapter, we're going to be covering the properties of alcohols and their reactions. The first thing we're going to discuss is the common nomenclature of alcohols. We've already covered the IUPAC nomenclature in an earlier chapter. There is a semi-systematic common nomenclature of alcohols, which is still widely used for smaller alcohols and common industrial alcohols. The way this common nomenclature works is that first, we find the longest carbon chain attached to the OH group. We name that carbon chain then as an alkyl group, in other words, with a YL ending. And then we add the word alcohol separated by a space after the name of that alkyl group. Some examples of this are shown below. So for example, here we have a methyl group attached directly to the hydroxyl group, the OH group. So we call this methyl space alcohol. The IUPAC for this would be methanol. An even more common one that's used because of its widespread use in medical and clinical settings is this one. Here we have an isopropyl group attached to our hydroxyl. So this is called isopropyl alcohol. Now, the IUPAC for this then would be propane to all, or in the older method, to propanol. I do want to point out, interestingly enough, for isopropyl alcohol, that there is an incorrect but widely used name. It's incorrect because it sort of mixes the common naming for the carbon chain with the structure of the name being IUPAC. That incorrect name is isopropanol. And while this is incorrect, it is widely used by chemists. Alcohols are arranged into different classifications, much like carbon groups, alkyl halides, several other types of uh, functional groups. For alcohols, what we do is we identify what we would call the alcohol carbon, which would be the carbon directly attached to the hydroxyl group. We then count how many carbon groups are there directly attached to that alcohol carbon. If there's no carbon groups attached to it, then we say it is a methyl alcohol. Technically, there's only one of those. If there's one carbon group, which would put this alcohol carbon at the end of the longest carbon chain, we would call that a primary alcohol. If there's two carbon groups, we call it a secondary alcohol. And if there are three carbon groups, it would be a tertiary carbon alcohol. I do want to point out that the carbon groups do not have to be identical, although I used the same symbol of R to represent our generic carbon group. The main significance of classifying alcohols is that we are going to see that certain reactions will behave differently with primary alcohols as it compared to secondary alcohols, and in fact, some reactions will not work at all on tertiary alcohols. I briefly want to review with you in a little bit more detail the acidity of alcohols, because alcohols are often used as acids or bases in chemical reactions. What we see when we look at the acidity of alcohols is that the pK of alcohols comes in a range from 15 on the lowest end to about 19 on the high end, 15 being the stronger acids, 19 being the weaker acids. This is the same range that we see for water, which has a pKa of 15.7. And in a sense, you could almost argue that water is like an alcohol, just with no carbon groups attached. What we see for this pKa range is that larger carbon groups on the alcohol make them less acidic. So we see that the pKa of methanol, which has a very small 
not sterically hindered carbon group is about 15. Whereas the pKa of tert butyl alcohol, again, using kind of the incorrect tert butanol, is about 19. We explain this pKa difference by looking at the effect of solvation on the conjugate base of the bronsted lowry acid base reaction. The reason why we do this is that when we first looked at acid strength, what we really found was to explain the strength of an acid, we would have to look at the stability of the conjugate base. The more stable the conjugate base, the stronger the related acid i.e. the lower the pKa number. What we see in our bronsted lowry acid base reaction is that our alcohol starts out um, electrically neutral, but it reacts with a base. The base deprotonates the OH hydrogen of the alcohol, and it leaves us with an alkoxide negative ion, where the negative charge is really centered on the oxygen of the alkoxide. What we see in solution then is that the solvent, in this case, for example, water, those molecules come up and they interact by intermolecular attractive forces with the negatively charged um, atom in the alkoxide. The positive end of the water comes up and has an attractive force with that negative alkoxide. What this does is it essentially kind of spreads that negative charge out in space, since in this region it's reduced by the charge balance, and then out here you have the negative charge. This lowers the potential energy of this species. We also, just to make the reaction complete, I want to point out that we do have uh, a conjugate acid of our base, but we're going to focus on this conjugate base. So the idea here is that when this becomes more stable, then more of the reactants are willing to shift over to the product side, thereby at a given concentration, making more of the acid react, making it a stronger acid. So solvation of the conjugate base increases the acidity of the acid. When we go to a larger carbon group then, like T-butyl, what we see is that the T-butyl is significantly larger. I've sort of tried to sketch out the relative outlines on my two pictures. So when we make the alkoxide now, these methyl groups are really hanging over that alkoxide negative oxygen. That's going to block a lot of the solvent molecules from being able to come in and have an an attractive interaction with that negative charge. So steric hindrance blocks solvation to some extent. Because of that reduced solvation, this is going to have a higher potential energy compared to like the methyl oxide ion. Therefore, this reactant is going to be less likely to come over here. And when we look at our relative concentrations, there's going to be a lot lower concentration of this compared to what we started with than when we had more solvation. Therefore, this is not going to react as readily as an acid. It's going to be a weaker acid. So the conjugate bases of sterically hindered alcohols are less stable, making the corresponding alcohols less acidic. In other words, the pKa number would be higher. One interesting thing I would like to note about this is that when alcohols were studied in the gas phase, where solvation no longer contributes to the potential energy of the species, the opposite trend was observed. T-butyl alcohol is the strongest acid in the gas phase without considering solvation. We also see, based on a similar concept, that phenyl alcohols are more acidic than our uh, regular alkane-derived alcohols. 
because their conjugate bases have resonance to stabilize it. Again, when your conjugate base is stabilized, your alcohol becomes more acidic. So when we deprotonate a phenyl alcohol, now this particular phenyl alcohol is called phenol, it makes a negative alkoxide, but then through resonance by pushing here and pushing out there, we delocalize that negative charge onto several carbons of the ring. That stabilizes that conjugate base, making this more favored, making that a stronger acid. The pKa of phenol is 10, which means it's five orders of magnitude stronger even than methanol. We're next going to look at the oxidation states of carbon. Now, we can use regular oxidation state calculations to calculate the specific oxidation state of carbons. However, we generally don't do that on a daily basis. Instead, we have kind of developed as organic chemists a shortcut that describes the oxidation state um, by looking at the types of bonds attached to the carbon. The core, there's a direct correlation between the types of bonds attached to the carbon and its oxidation state if we calculate the oxidation state number. I first want to introduce a term, heteroatoms. Heteroatoms are atoms of the non-metal elements that are more electroductive than carbon and hydrogen. So if we look at the periodic table, these would be nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, selenium, bromine, and iodide. All of the atoms that are in the upper right corner of the periodic table. What we see is that there are a wide variety of organic molecules or organic related molecules that have heteroatoms substituted in place of either hydrogens or carbons. What we find then is that the oxidation state of a carbon is directly related to the number of bonds that that given carbon has to heteroatoms. This is probably best explained with a chart. What we see is that alkanes and hydrocarbons typically have zero bonds between a given carbon to a heteroatom, since in hydrocarbons, for example, there are no heteroatoms. If we then replace one of the hydrogens or carbon groups on that carbon with an OH, we create an alcohol. And an alcohol on that alcohol carbon has one bond to oxygen, one bond to a heteroatom. We can then remove another group and make a double bond between that oxygen and the carbon. Now that carbon has two bonds to a heteroatom. We can remove another group and put another hydroxyl group. We would have three bonds. And finally, we could remove the final non-heteroatom group and make carbon dioxide, which has four bonds. What we see when we calculate oxidation numbers is that the oxidation number, the oxidation state, increases as we move across this series. What organic chemists have then done is they have correlated these structures to a particular functional group. So exa for example, a carbon that has one bond to a heteroatom is considered to be at the alcohol oxidation state. In many cases, that heteroatom will be an oxygen OH, so it will actually be an alcohol. But we could also look at, for example, having a chlorine here, chlorine being a heteroatom. That would be at the same oxidation state as an alcohol. Similarly, if we have just two bonds to oxygen and two groups that are carbons or hydrogens, that would be at the same oxidation state as an aldehyde and ketone. And again, if these were, for example, a hydrogen and a carbon, it would be an aldehyde, two carbons would be a ketone. But we could, for example, put a nitrogen here instead, having a double bond to nitrogen, that would be at the same oxidation state as an aldehyde or ketone. So in general, 
when organic chemists talk about oxidation state, we refer to the corresponding oxygen-based functional group. The next thing to notice is that if we do a reaction that moves us from one oxidation state to another, we can categorize that using redox language. So for example, if we start over here at the alkane oxidation state and we make an alcohol or we make uh, uh, an alkyl chloride, we would be increasing the oxidation state of the carbon that would be considered an oxidation reaction. So reactions that move in this direction are oxidations. Similarly, we're going to see very shortly reactions that start with an ketone and end with an alcohol. In that case, we would have done a reduction. Now the interesting thing about this then is that oxidation and reduction, that terminology is very well understood in organic chemistry and used quite frequently. We're going to see it directly in the names of our observed reactions. However, there are also reactions that, for example, start at the ketone oxidation state with a ketone. At the end, we have a nitrogen or some other heteroatom here, but still at the ketone oxidation state. And interestingly enough, we have no name for what that type of reaction is. So I made up a name. I call those heteroatom exchange reactions. These are going to be reactions where we don't change the oxidation state. We instead change the identity of the bonds to the heteroatoms. We change the heteroatoms that are being attached while maintaining the same number of bonds overall. This is really useful because we're going to see that a wide number of reactions that we study and in particularly biologically important reactions are actually heteroatom exchange reactions. We're also going to see that heteroatom exchange reactions have many characteristics in common across, across a wide variety of them.